people think that the spontaneous or completely natural life as it's understood by these Far Eastern philosophers is to act according to whim. There was, for example, a great Zen monk of uh, shortly after 1000 AD who had a very peculiar way of painting. He had long hair and he would certainly he'd get very drunk on uh, rice wine, then he'd soak his hair in ink and slosh it all over the paper. Then he would do a Rorschach test on it <laughs> and decide what kind of a landscape it actually was <laughs> and then put in the finishing touches. <laughs> and suddenly, out of this apparent mess, a great landscape would be evoked. But the whole art of the thing lay in putting in the finishing touches. And also, there's a very curious thing. If a person who is untrained in painting <coughs> makes a mess with a brush, it's liable to be just a mess. Whereas if a person who has the feeling of painting in them for a long time, and they make a mess with a brush or just do anything, uh, it looks interesting. And that's why if you try uh, to copy the best uh, people in modern, abstract, non-objective painting, you'll find it a very difficult thing to do. Because there is more to spontaneity than caprice and disorder. And I want to try and explain what that is. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could live <coughs> absolutely on the spur of the moment. Not make any uh, particular plans, not feel that... Uh, well, you might make plans, because you could make plans spontaneously. But <laughs> not to worry about whether you had made the right decision, whether you were being good or bad, selfish or unselfish, <laughs> and not to hesitate in anything, you see. Uh, in uh, w one of the great applications of Zen, as I pointed out, was to the art of fencing. And when you learn fencing, you see you have to learn to be spontaneous. Because here of all places it is true that he who hesitates is lost. If you're engaged in combat, you see, and you stop to think what sort of a defense or attack you ought to make, the enemy has got you. So the way they teach people spontaneity in fencing is very interesting. When you start in to fencing school, you of course live with the teacher. He has a kind of ashram. And, but you're given a janitorial job. You clean up, you wash dishes, you put bedding away and things like that. But while you're going about your daily business, the master surprises you with a practice sword, which is made of four strips of bamboo, rather loosely tied together. And he hits you with this, surprisingly and suddenly, from nowhere. And you are expected to defend yourself with anything available. With the bedding, with the broom, with the pots and pans, with just anything, defend. But the poor student never knows when the attack is coming, or where, what direction it's coming from, and he begins to get tense. And he begins to go around everywhere on sort of alert, you see, watching, watching which direction it's coming from. And as he goes down a certain passage, feeling that the master is probably lurking around that corner, and he's all set to go for him as that, if he gets that practice sword, he suddenly gets hit from behind. <laughs> so eventually, he gives up. There's absolutely no way of preparing for the attack. And so he just wanders around and feeling, well, if it hits, it's going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, he is ready to begin fencing. Because if you prepare for an attack from a, spe a specific direction, and it comes from some other direction, you have to withdraw from the direction in which you had expected it and send your energy in another direction, and that takes time. So what you do is, you go around with a mind of no expectation. That is called uh, mushin or munin. This is a very important Zen expression. Uh, mushin, it, it all means an empty mind. 
Uh, uh, you could also call it no heart, because the character Shin means both heart and mind, but it isn't quite the same as our word heartless, as we use it, and it isn't the same as the word mindless, as we use it, meaning stupid. To be in the state of Mushin is to have a mind like a mirror. And of this, uh, the Taoist sage Zhuangzi said, the perfect man employs his mind as a mirror. It grasps nothing, it refuses nothing, it receives but does not keep. And when uh, anything comes in front of the mirror, it reflects it instantly. The mirror doesn't wait to reflect it. They also say, when the moon rises, all bodies of water instantly reflect the moon. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't bother with physics about the speed of light or anything like that. Irrelevant. <laughs> or they say, when you clap your hands, the sound issues immediately. It doesn't can stop to consider whether it will issue. And so, sparks from the flint, when it's struck, they issue instantly. But to do this, you can't try to be quick. See, if a Zen master corners you with a funny situation and he puts you in a quandary expecting spontaneous action from you, don't try to hurry. I know I've watched Suzuki wait a whole minute before answering, but he doesn't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> He's not at all embarrassed by this wait. And he can answer with silence just as well as with a formal response. The point is, do something. When uh, two young Americans wanted to study Zen, they uh, were taken by a Japanese monk to interview the master and act as interpreter. And one of them had had some practice, you know, he knew a bit about it. And so after they had tea together and just discussed formalities, the master said in a very easy way, well, what do you gentlemen know about Zen? And one of these students threw his fan, which he hadn't unfolded, the fan was still folded up, he threw it straight at the master's face. The master slightly moved to one side, and the fan went and went right through the paper wall. And the master laughed like a child. Huh? Well, that's the sort of game they get in. Once the master was uh, going around through the forest with a group of students, and he picked up a tree branch. You know, this is one might pick up a tree branch. And suddenly he turned to one of his students and said, what is it? And he hesitated, so he hit it into the branch. And so another student was there, and he turned to him and he said, what is it? And he said, give it to me, I want to see it. I'll tell you. So the master tossed the branch to him, and he took it and hit the branch. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may think all oh, this is kind of rough stuff. <laughs> but let me give you another story, which is on a rather different level. A certain Zen priest was having dinner at a big party, and the party was being served by a geisha girl who was so elegant and so skillful in serving that he suspected she might have had some Zen training. And so he decided to try her out. And he nodded to her, and she immediately came to his place and sat down in front of his little low table. See, everybody was, would be seated, probably, in front of low tables all around the room, and the geisha servants and people move up and down in the middle. And so she came down and sat down in front of him and bowed, and he said, I would like to give you a present. And she said, I would be most honored. Now, on the table, there, is, there are hibachi, uh, which are... Uh, little braziers with hot charcoal in. And you move the charcoal around with iron chopsticks. He took a piece of charcoal out and iron chopsticks and offered it to her. She had long, long sleeves on her kimono, and what she did was this. She wound them all around her hands and took the charcoal. Immediately got up and went to the kitchen, disposed of the charcoal, changed her robe, which had holes turned all the way through the sleeves, and came back. And she sat down in front of the master and bowed. And he said, and she said to him, I would like to give you a present. He said, I would be most honored. <laughs> and so she picked up the hand chopsticks and handed him the charcoal. And he pulled out a cigarette 
and said, that's just what I wanted, and lit the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the lesson. The master's spontaneity and being ready for that situation was the kind of quick thinking that a good comedian has, who in a completely unprepared way can make all sorts of jokes and turn any situation into a jest of some kind. Uh, there are all sorts of people who do that. Uh, people who are experts in kind of like Dorothy Parker in that sort of repartee. But here it's been developed in a, a very fundamental way and to a very high degree. Now, the, the way in which it's developed, you see, requires a protected situation. Be uh, because if we all started to act on the spur of the moment without the slightest consideration or deliberation, um, everybody would think we were crazy. And the people would avoid us and call the police and things like that. But what they do is this. They start you doing this in the context of a disciplined situation where there are very rigid rules for most of the time, but there are certain instances at which all those rules go hang. And you're in a community which understands the game. Because the point is this. When you start acting spontaneously, you're not used to doing it. And therefore, your responses are unintelligent and inappropriate. But when you become used to doing it,
man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the I that knows me when I know that I know that I know. <laughs> you see? Now, in this way, we think about thinking. We worry about worrying. And then when that really gets bad, you worry because you worry about worrying. <laughs> now, that is analogous exactly to the kinds of vibration that are set up in certain mechanical systems. For example, if you, uh, I, I did this trick on television once. I had the, the cameraman turn the camera on the monitor. The monitor is the television set in the studio where you see what you are doing. And so on this, this show I said, now I'm going to show you a picture of anxiety. <laughs> don't worry about your sets. There's not going to be anything wrong with your sets, so don't turn it off. Now I said, Mr. Cameraman, will you please turn the camera on the monitor? He does that, and what does he do? He's taking a picture of taking a picture, all in the same system. And as you do that, the system starts going like that. You see, and it makes it sets up a kind of oscillation. And you see on the screen all these jagged lines dancing across. Now that's what's meant, you see, by hesitation, attachment, blocking, all that kind of thing which the Zen discipline is designed to overcome. And because the human being is such a peculiarly, beautifully organized nervous system, and has this tremendously subtle cortex, which is capable of all kinds of thinking about thinking. You, you, you can turn yourself on in the most extraordinary ways by, for example, getting uh, earphones, which repeat what you say just a fraction of a second after you say it, back to you, they delay it. And you can get an oscilloscope tied up with your own heartbeats and get feedback through in this way so that you suddenly begin to see yourself behaving and it completely balls you up because you wait for yourself to go on but then you realize it's you doing it but you can't wait on your heartbeat you can't wait on what you say and you get this sensation of going faster and faster and faster and faster until you just have to close the whole thing off <laughs> you'll go crazy so that's what we're doing and our Civilization and our social institutions reflect this in hundreds of ways. And this would be true of any civilization, because all civilization is based on the development of consciousness and feedback, that is to say, the property of self-control, of being self-conscious, looking at what you've done, and then being able to criticize it and correct it. But who criticizes? Is the critic reliable? When you criticize yourself, who will criticize the critic? You see? Or to put it in the other way, pis custodiate, ipsos custodies. Who will guard the guards themselves? Who will take care of the policemen? Who will govern the president? And that is the big problem. And when we get tied up in that problem, the Chinese got tied up in it because they were simply a very high order of civilization. So did the Japanese. There has to be a break. Somebody has to start throwing things. Otherwise, everybody will go insane. So, Zen functions in that culture as a way of liberation from the tangle of being too civilized. Now you see, in Japanese culture, people are tremendously concerned with propriety, with good manners, and with uh, keeping up with the Joneses. One of the funniest things in the world is to watch Japanese people having a bowing contest. <laughs> Uh, it's a very frequent thing when friends meet or take leave, they go, ah, and they bow and they bow and they would bow and they go back and forth and see who gets the last one in because I'm more polite than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And the worry is about when somebody comes, you know, we visit a family, you always bring a gift. And they start worrying, is this gift suitable? Now, what, is it anything as good as the gift they last gave us? And uh, is it right for the occasion? Have we thought about it enough? Is there some symbolism in this gift that connects with this person's name or their birthday or something like that? And we think about these things in And thus they cultivate it in the, in the ordinary culture. Uh, it has a great deal of social nervousness in it. People giggle. You often see girls who giggle and cover their mouths to, to say, I'm not really giggling. Uh, all sorts of funny things happen because of this immense uh, social uh, awareness and nervousness. Now, Zen breaks that up. Only it does it in a way that is has high artistry to it. So you see, in let's just take the, the, the aesthetic domain for the moment. And you remember I was discussing yesterday uh, one tea bowl. And you remember too that in the whole history of ceramics, the Chinese developed some of the most elegant work imaginable. You are probably aware, I don't see a specimen, of the great work of the Sung and Korean potters. Very often done in a jade-like green, the most gorgeous uh, texture. Uh, it looked practically as if it was carved out of jade. Well, that led on, you see, to the, to the high techniques of the Ming Dynasty with translucent porcelain, white clay, the most subtle design of all. And that style went also to Japan. And the very, very rich people you read about in, say, books like The Tale of Genji, and you see in a film, and you must see it, Chushingura, uh, the story of the 47 Ronin. The lovely things they had around their houses were unbelievable. The lacquer, the boxes in pure gold, and, uh, oh, you know, it was delicious stuff. Now, what happened? The people who practiced then suddenly got an eye for the beauty of the ordinary. There were two reasons for this. One was that they became fascinated with what happened spontaneously, what pattern a brush would make when handled roughly and the hairlines were shown. They also, because they practiced Sazen, which is sitting quietly, not thinking of anything special, but having a completely open mind, that puts you into a state where you get much better eyes and ears than you ordinarily have. You start really seeing things. So you know that famous haiku poem, the old pond, the frog jumps in, plop. In Japanese, that plop is mizu no otto, sound of the water. And there's another poem just like it. In the dark forest, a berry drops, the sound of the water. Somebody suddenly realized, you see, just the sound of the water is, is marvelous. That's all. Or they found that um, they, they kept getting in very, very cheap Korean rice bowls. The poorest, cheapest kind for peasants to eat out of. And suddenly it struck one of these Zen masters that that was an incomparably beautiful object. Nobody had seen this before. They also had the simplest wooden labels, uh, bamboo 
and then a stick in it for use in the kitchen. And one day somebody noticed that this ordinary everyday kitchen utensil was just lovely. And so in the same way they found that it was quite as satisfactory to listen to the kettle boiling as to listen to an elaborate concert. So what did they do? They started through particularly a man called Senna Rikyu to give parties for very small guests, few guests in shacks, little huts in the garden made of uh, very primitive materials such as mud walls and where they would go and sit and out of the simplest utensils carefully chosen by a superb uh, artist they would simply sit and enjoy the uncomplicated life and so was born the tea ceremony they started through particularly a man called Senna Rikyu to give parties a very small get, few guests in shacks, little huts in the garden made of uh, very primitive materials such as mud walls and where they would go and sit and out of the simplest utensils carefully chosen by a superb uh, artist they would simply sit and enjoy the uncomplicated life and so was born the tea ceremony now look at that you see in the historical context that's terribly important it was a going back to the primitive after people were sick of too much civilization and yet it was going on to the primitive rather than back because the people who selected all those things they knew they knew the whole tradition of their civilization their culture they weren't barbarians and what's happened today is this tea ceremony is essentially something uh, to enjoy and there are a few men left who know how to serve tea ceremony and it's an extremely congenial quiet get together of easy conversation simple and unostentatious manners and really lovely things to look at I was present at a tea ceremony celebrated by a Zen monk who happens to be an American and he's a man who uh, has done a lot of mountaineering and he has therefore with him at all times uh, the sort of equipment that knowledge would prevent us from being surprised by the work of these people because we would know how it's done and when you know how something is done it doesn't surprise you that's why there's a Zen poem that says if you ask where the flowers come from even the God of Spring doesn't know certainly the God of Spring would be supposed to know where the flowers come from but the truth of the matter is he doesn't and so in the same way uh, if you ask the Lord God how do you create the universe he said I have no special method <laughs> And this, uh,
This is known in Zen. It's a very difficult, this is the most difficult virtue to attain. So many of these things begin with move. Uji. <laughs> Uji. It means nothing special. <laughs> it means no business, no artificiality. In American current, real cool. <laughs> Uh, so, buji is where something doesn't stand out like a sore thumb, but it is absolutely different from being modest. A buji person may be immodest in the sense that if he knows he can do something well, he just says he can. He doesn't care at all sorts of <coughs> blushing violet techniques. Buji, you see, is this mysterious quality of nothing special, no special method. Because if there is, let me repeat, if we do know the method and we know it infallibly, it ceases to be interesting. There are no surprises left. And the moment the element of surprise is gone, the, the zest of life is gone. That, you see, is why it's very difficult to teach Zen to yourself. Because you can't easily surprise yourself. The essence, you see, of this kind of spontaneity is response to a surprise. So the master, you don't know what he's going to do, and he surprises you. It's like trying to cure hiccups. Very difficult to cure yourself, because when you pat yourself on the back, you know when you're going to do it. <laughs> so you're all ready for it. When somebody else comes up and slams you on the back, then that's a surprise. And what you needed was a surprise. Or it's like uh, jokes. What makes you laugh about a joke is the element of surprise in it. That's why jokes aren't funny after they've been explained. <laughs> so in the same way, all these Zen stories if explained, have no effect. They're intended to produce what I would call metaphysical laughter. But this has to be a surprise. And so as to be surprised, well, it was no way of premeditating it. So, you see, if you read, for example, there's a book out here called Zen by Eugen Herigl, who studied archery. Many of you have probably read this book. He had to learn to pull the bowstring in the manner of the Japanese archer and let it go, but not on purpose. He had to let it go without thinking first, I'll let it go, and then let go. He had to let it go not on purpose. Now, that really bugged Herigl. How do you do something not on purpose? Especially if you're aiming at a target. <laughs> well, the whole point is, if you think before you shoot, it's too late. The target's moved. That's why we have a thing like beginner's luck. You see, if you simply point at something like that, if your finger was a gun, I would probably have hit the light switch. And so you get a person who's naive about a gun, who pick a gun up and bam, and, and the thing will be will drop dead. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I ever used a slingshot. This friend of mine was with me and he was aiming away and not missing, and I just picked it up and ping, and it hit. So I couldn't do it again. <laughs> uh, it, it, you get a certain naturalness there. So, there was a master by the name of uh, Ikkyu, who was a great leg puller. And he had in front of his house a very gnarled pine tree. One of those things that contorted, and they loved this kind of thing. And he put a notice up by it, 
said, I, Ikyu, will pay 100 yen, which was a fair amount of money in those days, to anyone who can see this tree straight. Well, soon, there was a whole crowd of people around that tree, lying on the ground and <laughs> twisting their necks and looking at it from all sorts of angles. And there was absolutely no way of seeing the tree with a straight trunk. But Ikyu had a friend who was a priest of another sect, and a smart boy went over to see this friend and said, uh, what about this Mr. Ikyu's tree? Oh, said the other priest, it's perfectly simple. He said, you go and tell him the answer to seeing the tree straight is to look straight at it. <laughs> so this man went over to Ikyu and said, I claim the reward. He said, you look straight at it. And Ikyu looked at him in a funny way and said, he just walked out of the hundred yen and gave it to him to say, I think you've been talking to Rosen down the street. <laughs> <laughs> now, in that way, you see, just look straight at it. In other words, here's the bow string, let go of it. All this fimble fambling, nimble mambling, jumble humble about uh, the right technique of letting go of it. Let go of it, damn it. Uh, but that's very difficult. As if I would say to you, now, everybody, let's be unself-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, in desperation, you at last learn to let go of the thing, uh, which was what you were supposed to do all the time. And then, one is, as again, as a child. This is original innocence. So, this is the meaning of the person who was asked, what do you do here in the Zen institution? He said, we eat when hungry and we sleep when tired. And he said, that's being just like everybody else. They all do that. He said, they do not. When they eat, they don't eat. They think of all sorts of extraneous matters. When they're tired, they don't sleep. They dream all kinds of dreams.